Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. It's Sunday night, June 30th, just before the 4th of July here in 2019. I got a question for you. Are you growing in Christ? I don't even know what you're talking about. When we speak of progress in our spiritual walk, we call it growing. Growing in Christ, growing in both the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter warned his readers of the danger of being led away with the error of the wicked, falling from our own spiritual steadfastness and challenging these folks to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 3.18 this grace is literally the divine influence of God upon your heart as it is reflected in the way you live. It operates in your life, in your heart, initially to challenge you with the cause of Christ, to lead you into that relationship. But it does not leave you there. Once you are saved, there is a growing process. You don't know what you don't know. To, to know something or to know someone in the way that you need to speaks of the influence of intimacy. You need to know the Lord Jesus Christ intimately. It's the intimacy that we have in Christ illustrated in the Bible. For example, the Bible teaches us that we have all we need in the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, we are sons. God has no daughters. Heirs of God through Christ. Only sons can inherit. We have the peace that passes all understanding, Philippians 4, 7. And we have that through Christ. And we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us, Philippians 4, 13. In the Old Testament, the phrase is commonly found or find grace. And the only exception I could find is with the story of Queen Esther, who obtained grace. But she was not obtaining grace from God. She was obtaining grace from her husband, the king. In his world, no one approached him unless he asked for them. She walked in to the throne room boldly. After much prayer and the prayer of others knowing this could be her death warrant the grace that she got to do that was from god but the grace she obtained was from the king a grace that allowed him to ignore the law which required her death simply by approaching at the end of the age, God says, while he will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, he will also pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. Zechariah 12, 9 and 10. It's this grace that we need. Without it, only God's holiness prevails. And God's holiness demands justice. It is this grace we see throughout the New Testament. Romans chapter 3, we are justified in the sight of God by grace. In Romans chapter 5, we have access to the very throne room of God and to this grace by faith. 
In Romans chapter 5, a little bit later on, it is in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ that we receive what is called an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it is by God's grace that I am what I am, Paul says. What was he? He was a Christian. He was a saved soul with a standing before God. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Jesus told Paul that my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness, your weakness. It is in this grace that believers are declared righteous in the sight of God. For we know we are not inherently righteous. Were it based on what we are, naturally no one would see God. For Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, only the pure in heart shall see God. And the human being is not that person. The point here is that it's only in Christ that any human being can find peace with God. And more than peace, they can find righteousness. Righteousness, a moral, spiritual condition whereby we are declared right before God, morally right, spiritually right. Galatians 2.21 says it doesn't come from the law, what we might do or not do. If that were so, we would be required to always do right, or we would lose our standing. But we have been redeemed, redemption bought out of the marketplace of sin, by the blood of the Lamb, bought back. The Lord Jesus Christ was the one who offered the sacrifice that made that possible. The one who took upon himself the sin of the world. My sin, your sin, the sin of every human being who has ever lived or ever shall. Meaning that if people do not end up in heaven, it won't be because of their natural sin condition. All human sin has been removed. Born by the Lord Jesus Christ as God's sacrificial lamb, sacrificed unto God in the only acceptable sacrifice that could be made taking away the inherent sinfulness of all men, reorienting all men toward Christ, so that now it's not what you do or not do, but rather what you do with Christ that matters. It is not my sins that would condemn me, it's my failure, my refusal to accept Jesus Christ as God's sin bearer. This is the subtlety the natural man just cannot comprehend, in large part because he doesn't want it. The natural man stands on his own two feet, bowing to no one. For the Christian, it's only through faith that we understand anything about God, Hebrews 11.3. And it's only by God's grace, a gift given, that we are saved. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in the garden, he prayed that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent, John 17.3. In Matthew 11, we learn this is something no man knows, nor can know, unless the Son reveals it to him. Verse 27, Jesus said, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Therefore, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. The issue here is God's grace, the pure, unrecompensed kindness and favor made available through the Lord Jesus Christ. Does this mean that God is withholding grace from a majority of people based upon the things they do or don't do? No. That's the dynamic of works. Grace ceases to be grace if God is compelled to withhold it because of something you've done. Grace is the pure, unrecompensed kindness, favor of God, given freely, coming with no requirements. It's grace. It cannot be exercised where there is even the slightest degree of human merit. It cannot be granted however, where there is the slightest degree of sin. Sin hinders grace. Sin restricts grace. Sin hides it. And it's this sin that is man's hopeless condition. Not the result of his attitudes or behaviors. Rather, because he is cut off from God, as illustrated by Adam being banned from the garden where he once had fellowship with God. God placing angels and a flaming sword guarding the entrance to keep Adam and Eve from returning. The condition for salvation is to recognize that hopeless, helpless condition and repudiate it. Of course, the mere repudiation simply acknowledges the problem. Nothing changes unless or until the sinner repents of his sin, calling it what it is. Sin, this, the condition, not the individual behaviors, all they, although they do loom large in his mind at the time, but repenting is recognizing, repudiating, renouncing the former way of life, the sins of this world. Again, this alone simply acknowledges what God already knows. There must also be repentance and belief. They have to go hand in glove. Yes, I have repented of all of that, but now I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that he is God. I believe that he bore my sin on that awful cross. I believe that he paid my price before God, that he rose from the dead to illustrate new life, and that he now lives to make intercession for me before God. Jesus satisfied God's law, the law that says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now, today, those who repent of sin, believing that Jesus paid that awful price, have a new standing before God, that of a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Verse 18, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. We go around telling people what happened. Verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, not charging to their account the trespasses that they have committed. And he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. We carry that word everywhere we go, that God has reconciled us, and he can reconcile you. He took our sin upon himself. He paid the ultimate price, death. He did that that we who have repented and believed on him should have life. Not an extended human existence, but eternal life with Jesus forever. As Jesus was resurrected from the dead, 
the Bible says, so shall we. We will be resurrected to everlasting life. You see, it's at this point, the point of salvation, that we begin our new life. We put off the old ways, the old ways of thinking and of doing, and we put on the new. It is at once an immediate thing because we have life now and forgiveness. But it's also a progressive thing as we discover new areas of our old life that we need to put off in order that we might put on the new. The Bible tells us what are the new. It's why Christians study the Bible. But other Christians who have been through all this are also helpful. Human beings seem to love reinventing the wheel. Until we see it for ourselves, we tend not to accept it as truth, or at least not as important. But we would do well to watch other Christians to see how they're doing it. We would do well to listen to other Christians to understand why. To read the Bible and so learn the importance of this why. And meditate on what we've learned from the Bible. Let it percolate through our entire system. Memorizing significant Bible verses that we might be reminded. And above all this, to pray. To pray for forgiveness every day. To pray for the fellowship. To pray as a ministry as we pray for others and to be open to others of like precious faith that we might see ourselves as others do. Is that how you see the Christian life? Or is it just about going to church, saying prayers, and carrying a Bible? 